It was a successful night at Kepler's last Thursday, with many books signed by an increasingly renowned local author, James Workman. No less than 105 admirers came to listen to him present his new book, Heart of Dryness. But the main question you're always getting is, what's it about? If the person happens to be a uh, conservative Republican, I say, well, I'm glad you asked, because it's a book about how a small band of resourceful individuals push back and triumph over the heavy hand of big government. <laughs> and uh, if the person happens to be a liberal Democrat, I say, yeah, I'm glad you asked, because it's a situation of, of climate change and, and global warming and the, the water scarcity and how uh, you know, we can respond to this by tapping into the indigenous wisdom of, of Aboriginal people. And if the person happens to be my mother, <laughs> the answer is that you know, it's a story about a wise old matriarch whose family and friends don't necessarily recognize her wisdom and her ways until under a really tight circumstances uh, where she really, you know, they turn to her and she guides them out of a desperate situation. All three of those answers are true and all three of them I think, you know, interplay and I hope uh, prove as, as educational as they are entertaining. In 1990, Workman gravitated towards water as a journalist and then as an aide to the U.S. Secretary of Interior, Bruce Babbitt. And of course, I was a young man in a hurry. I was an ambitious guy back in Washington, and pretty soon the uh, United States was just too small a stage for me. And all this fell apart in a humiliating conversion on the road to Damascus. Botswana had cut off the Bushmen for various reasons, which, which the book goes into, basically for mining and for tourism. Said, you know, we're going to be like America. We don't want you guys here anymore. We've been delivering water to you in these trucks for 10 years and no more. So now you have to leave. And uh, the Bushmen said, well, no, we're not going to leave. We've lived here 30,000 years. Um, I've lived here, you know, personally longer than you've been a country. And Botswana didn't know quite how to deal with it. They said, okay, well, we're going to set up a, a siege around the central Kalahari. In wanting to save the Bushmen, workmen entered the Forbidden Desert. Vroom, vroom, I'm, I'm, I'm going through the Kalahari. It's like you're going through an ocean. On the, the sand there, it's just <laughs> devastating. Only to get stranded in the middle of nowhere and suddenly you don't feel very heroic. Um, and you realize over the course of a couple of nights alone there how you know, humbling this was for me because the Bushmen, they were doing just fine without my you know, help. At that point, I wanted to see but what we could learn from the Bushmen, how the Bushmen could help us. And it wasn't no long, any longer a, you know, a charity mission. It wasn't a heroic mission. It was an investigation that, that then you know, took the next five years, six years to figure out how these guys operate. It finally dawned on me after a couple of years, the whole you know, kind of Copernican shift that uh, where we think you need to manage water for people, they realize that people were managed by water, that water manages us. And it does so at a, you know, as, as I said, a cellular level, at a political level, at an economic level, in everything we eat, in how we live, and where we go, and how we relate to one another. In the end, workmen did help the Bushmen in their fight and got blacklisted for doing so. And in some ways, it, it helped that they nudged me out of the country. Um, because after, <laughs> after hating the Kalahari that first time when I broke down there, uh, I, I came to love it. Uh, it really does get under your skin. Um, there's no place like it on earth with this unbroken expanse. It was time to come home and bring back here what lessons I could and to see if, if through this book and through the story, uh, I could maybe shed some light on their world and, equally important, bring something of the Kalahari and the Bushmen into our own world. He described the useful practices of trading and ownership of water. I mentioned this on a, on a radio station, and he said, well, how do you own shares of water, for gosh sakes? You know, water just slips through your fingers, right? And it's just like, well, it's, you know, you actually own shares of your radio time, and you, that you can't touch that. We all own shares of, of frequent flyer miles, probably or credit card loyalty points, um, and you can't touch that. That's basically the lesson I got from the Bushmen. They obviously don't have frequent flyer miles, but they do have a constant interaction of whose share is this? If we can barter the water we save, then we have an incentive to conserve. We have an incentive to use less. Right now, our only incentive to use less is to say, like, I need to do good. I need to, I need to help the planet. 
But the irony is that under the monopoly that we're, we're facing, we're punished for doing so. Our rates go up, uh, our next door neighbor can use, use more water that we don't use. And it's just so absurdly cheap right now um, that there's, there's no incentive not to, except that, that water price is really hidden. All of us, you know, think of monopolies as like, oh yeah, AT&T or Standard Oil or uh, Microsoft or now perhaps Google. Uh, the monopoly that we live with most intimately every single day of our life is the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. And that isn't to say they're good or bad, it's just the way that we've co-evolved with them. A monopoly does not allow negotiations over prices. This is what we've given, this is what we pay, that's the way it is. And so that creates a, a, a very difficult situation to, to diversify supply or start you know, thinking outside of the box. But uh, the Bushmen, uh, you know, once they were especially, again, cut off from, from the government, they were relying on this constant uh, interaction with themselves and with nature and with one another. Um, and so they had no monopoly. They were in many ways more liberated and more free than, than you and I. Workman concluded that a tradable human right to water would not only be empowering at an individual level, but also lead us to better conservation. Uh, if you could raise your hands if, you've, if today you've flushed a toilet, <laughs> if you've brushed your teeth, yeah. if you've um, watered the flowers, then each one of you, and hopefully by the time you've read this book, you realize I am a water management expert. Because that demand side, we've hit, we've hit how much we can supply, but in terms of what you use and how much you use, and how you capture it, that makes you the experts. Thank you so much uh, for coming here. And I really appreciate it. This event was brought to you by Kepler's Bookstore and its Literary Circle. To become a member, please log on to Kepler's.com.